Assalamu alaikum my dear sisters and my brothers and welcome to part 3 of the magic evil eye and envy. As I mentioned uh, in part 2, there is a khutbah, a sermon, that shall be given inside hellfire. The sheikh or the scholar who will give it shall be Lucifer, a shaitan, the, the iblis, the, the chief shaitan. That's him who will go be the speaker. The listeners are going to be the jinn and the humans who fell into his trap. Now, listen and please do listen carefully to what a shaitan say. Because what he says and what the sheikhs and people claim about magic are two different worlds. This khutbah or this warning even though it's going to happen in future. But Allah told it to us in the past. It's like you take somebody to the future and you tell him a story to the past to make that future become the present. For example, if I tell you in two weeks time I'm going to take you to Hawaii and once there you will see things different and you would have felt good and you would have eaten this and you would have you see now i am i'm taking you to the future and speaking of the past in the future and you in your mind you start imagining the now because i would say and then you wake up and last night you went to the bar and you actually did swim and the, and the ice cream you ate the brain will start bringing the future to now and you start seeing it like it happened yesterday. And this is one of the techniques that Allah uses in the Quran. He talks to us about the future, but he uses, the tense he uses is in the past and to us it means the now. Here is this uh, khutbah, which Allah has summarized, summarized in one ayah, no more than 44 words. But it delivers one of the most, it delivers one of the most scary and, 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 and freezing, blood freezing uh, statements. Allah says in the Quran, وَقَالَ الشَّيْطَانُ لَمَّا قُضِيَ الْأَمْرِ And the shaytan would say on judgment day, when the matter, i.e. judgment day, has been concluded. The people to paradise have gone and the people to hellfire have gone and now people are inside hellfire. And a shaytan is giving this khutbah. The first thing shaytan starts by telling the people who are in hellfire with him, eternity for them, he says, "Inna Allah wa'adakum wa'ad al-haq, wa wa'adtukum fa'akhlaftukum." Indeed, Allah has promised you the promise of truth, and you can see it. You are in hellfire, and now you can see that you didn't follow the word of Allah on earth. You pay the price. So this is a promise of truth. Wa wa'adtukum, and I, Shaitan talking, promised you. And I failed you. <laughs> I promised you the good life. I promised you. I, and now you are in hell fire. You are in the deepest problems that you will encounter ever in your life. And the last thing you want to hear when inside hellfire is the person that got you there telling you that there is nothing I can do for you. Yeah. Imagine this. Imagine this. I cannot do for you anything here. And then Shaitan goes on to clarify a couple of things. He said, وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سلطان. And I had no authority or power over you. You know, if magic, evil eye and envy, if they were the producer of the Shaitan and his party, then the Quran is lying to us. If the shaitan says, I have no power, I had no power over you. Magic, evil eye and envy and possessing and inhabiting the body of the person, things like that, are powers that the shaitan have over us. Then he carry on. Imagine this, he, he's saying this to the people who trusted and followed him. He tells them, وَمَا كَانَ لِيَ عَلَيْكُمْ مِنْ سُلْطَانِ And I had no authority or power over you. 
except illa anya da'awtukum fastajabtum li except I only invited you through whispers and you responded to me this is the only tool in the misguidance toolbox that a shaitan possesses was was planting thoughts in your mind bringing new ideas whispering to you that's and this is the best he could do i invited you but you responded to me so when people hear this they start getting mad at him you got us in problems and you're telling us this why you 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 when people starts blaming a shaitan he adds something else completely disturbing he goes fala talumuni do not blame me walumu anfusakum and blame yourselves in hell fire when people hear this with their own ears and see it with their very own eyes and now they know the truth of what's going to happen to them they start screaming and the panic explodes in front of them and they go and cry to a shaitan you are the most knowledgeable of us you are lucifer you guided us here please help we want to get out from here please safeguard us at which point a shaitan will say fala talumuni walumu anfusakum ma ana bi musrikhikum wa ma antum bi musrikhi i am not able to rescue you nor are you able to rescue me <sighs> in hell fire he tells you you and i are in the same boat i can do nothing for you and you can do nothing for me and then he throws everybody in hell fire except himself under the bus he goes inni kafartum inni kafartu bima ashraktumuni min qabl i reject i denounce everything you associated me with before i e if someone kills of course it's whisper of shaitan it's shaitan who whisper planted the thing right but on judgment day he will tell you i denounce you what you have done is so so wrong you shouldn't have done it and then as he looks at them and they are in complete terror he tells them inna al-zalimin lahum 'adhabun alim surely the transgressors you people are looking at me you the wrong doers the evil wrong doers you will have a painful torment yes a painful punishment powerful torture in hellfire and this is in surah ibrahim ayah 22 learn this and teach it to your children so that you don't become a spectator you don't become in the audience of shaitan when he says exactly these very words on judgment day if shaitan had magic people would have brought it to him here and that is why there is no magic there is no such thing as magic there is no such thing as evil eye there is no such thing as envy or possessing a human being or marrying a jinn or things like that thoughts do not bring evil plots and deeds and bad actions these bring evil you can sit home and wish all the evil of the world to anyone and nothing will happen to the other people unless you leave the couch and go out and hurt them physically and plot against them only then will your action harm but if you sit home and just i'm evil eye in you i'm i'm envying you to death and nothing's going to happen and my dear sisters and my brothers to avoid us standing in front of the shaitan on judgment day in hellfire we need to creep out from the big hole the dark hole that the religious institution has built around this horrible topic of magic shaitan has no ma- ma- I, I, i will tell you something yeah 
This is a personal story that happened to me maybe 40 years or maybe 40 years, maybe even more. One day, uh, when I was young in my teenagerhood, I think I was 15, 16 years of age, coming to life, trying to find my place in this world and things like that, I used to go with um, uh, the husband of my uh, aunt. He was a businessman and he would go to different markets and sell this. So one day we went to this city and it has a beautiful beach. It's so beautiful. So instead of working with him, uh, we, uh, me and my cousins, we went to the beach and spent the day there. And the poor guy took us there to help him. But hey, it's, you know, youth and all that kind of stuff. And then at one point I wanted to drink water. And we didn't have, and we didn't want to go to my uh, uh, uncle, let's call him uncle, because we know if we went there, he's going to get us to work. So we didn't want to do that. So where did we got water from? We looked around, and then we saw a bunch of people standing up there by that mount. And I told him, look, I'm sure these are people by a source of water, some kind of fountain, and they tried to get water. Let's go there and get some water. He goes, okay. So there we go. We walk there, and us and the cousins, because I was talking to one of the cousins, then we took the rest. And we went there. And as we approached, that didn't look like a fountain and people trying to get water. And people were standing there as if they were in salat prayers. I think, what's that? I guess I don't know. So we get there, and uh, my poor connection with Islam at that time, I didn't even know Islam existed back then. But anyhow, so we get there. And uh, yeah, lo and behold, there is a fountain, tons of uh, candles and food and uh, coins thrown in water and some ribbons, blue, pink, green, red. And I said, there you go, what is that? He goes, I don't know. So we went and I want to go to get water because I just wanted water and the water is there in the fountain, but all this scene behind it. And as I tried to go to it, I was stopped. They didn't let me go near water. I said, so why is that? They go, oh, this is the place where the saint, and they named the person, I don't remember his name. And I go, and what am I supposed to do? They go, you should respect or he will harm you. And I said, how will, we, how will he harm me? Oh, they go, he has control over the jinn and he can put a spell against you. Oh. And that is the first time I hear of all this. I said, okay. And then I, I really got miffed. I didn't like what they did. And at one point, I went and peed in that fountain to the terror of people and how they looked at me. They actually ran away from me, thinking that whoever saint is there is going to strike and is going to strike hard. Why? Because this young man who just skipped in between them and instead of drinking from the fountain, of course I gave them my back, I wouldn't urinate in front of them, and started uh, peeing in there. And it really was a uh, sight. Hey, guess what? I'm still here healthy and nothing has happened to me. Why? Because uh, from that young age, I never ever believed in this nonsense of magic and today is no different. Thoughts themselves by themselves do not produce actions. But the plots that we decide and the deeds that we do based on our thoughts is what harms. And that is the hazard. A hazard or envy is any ill feelings to take what the other person has and you do something about it. To avoid us standing in front of the shaitan on that day, Allah put the Quran in front of us. This is what's going to be said to you. So don't be a spectator. Don't be in the audience. And how do we not want to be in there? He goes, لا تتبعوا خطوات الشيطان. Do not follow the steps, the footsteps of shaitan. He certainly is your declared enemy. What Allah, this is in Surah number 6, Ayah 142. What Allah is saying is this. A shaitan will start slow. A shaitan never tells somebody, go steal a million. A shaitan tells somebody, start by stealing a penny. And then a dollar. And then five dollars. And then ten dollars. And these are the footsteps of shaitan that Allah has warned us against. In another ayah, Allah states it clear, loud and clear. Ya Bani Adam, children of Adam. La yaftinannakum shaytan. Do not let a shaytan deceive you. 
as he deceived your parents out of the garden. In another ayah, Allah says, O you who have believed, do not follow the footsteps of a shaitan. And whoever follows the footsteps of a shaitan, well, you should know that he, a shaitan, certainly does order or command you to commit sexual debaucheries and evil deeds. If we have to take today the, one of the biggest sins on earth is sexual fornication. Everyone and their cat would want a girlfriend, a boyfriend and things like that. So here Allah is clear about certain elements. So shaitan would order us to commit sexual debaucheries and evil deeds. In another ayah, again this is something that's going to be said to us on judgment day. Allah tells it to us today. Alam ahad ilaykum ya bani adama alla ta'budu shaitan? Did I not trust to you, children of Adam, that you shall not worship a shaitan? He certainly is your declared and sworn enemy, and it's clear. The ibadah is follow the orders of. And then Allah says, do not follow the orders of shaitan. He is your sworn and declared enemy. And worship me. This is a straight path. And shaitan has misguided so many generations of you before you. أَفَلَمْ تَكُونُ تَعْقِلُونَ Weren't you able to see that? And this is on judgment day for the people who are going to enter uh, hellfire. The result of these uh, warnings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and why we should do this so that on judgment day we are not told هَذِهِ جَهَنَّمُ الَّتِي كُنْتُمْ تُعَادُونَ This is Jahannam, the hellfire that once you were promised Today you shall be roasted in it. Why? Because of what you used to reject and deny. See, there is a huge number of ayat in the Quran in which Allah states and clarifies that a shaitan is a sworn, dedicated, non-stop enemy to us. Ultimately, his goal is to take every single one of us into hellfire by any means. If that means he will lie to us, he will do it. Or promises, uh, makes wrong promises, empty promises, he'll do that. Do you think a shaitan, if he had magic, he'd be wasting his time with all these uh, whispers? No! He would go to a place, to a mall where there are tons of people, to a soccer field, a stadium. And then he just puts one spell and everybody is doomed. But that is the case because humans don't think the way Allah wants them to. And that's why they end up with beliefs not as Allah wants them to. If Allah had given powers to a shaitan to apply magic, evil eye, envy, and inhabit humans, then all the Quran in which Allah warns us against a shaitan is a pure lie and a vile evil. Because Allah is, is not being honest with us here. He's given shaitan more powers. If the jinn can work with magic and they can produce spells and do this, and then we are doomed. But they are not, they cannot. After all, Surah An Nas, that is the Surah number 114 at the far end of the Quran, where we ask Allah to seek refuge in the Lord of the mankind, Allah, that is. And then we ask Him, we seek refuge in the King, the owner of mankind, and the God of mankind. What are we asking Allah to protect us from? It's not the magic of a shaitan. It's not the knives of a shaitan. It's not the bullets of a shaitan. It's his whispers. 
That's the only two. So next time somebody says jinn inhabit the shaitan does this, tell him go read Al Quran. What you are doing right now is shirk. You are associating with Allah. That's what you are doing right now. You see, mankind have been privileged by the brain that we use today. A brain that when we use in the right direction, we made tons upon tons of iron fly the plane. You take a 747, one of the big planes with people, sometimes almost 600 people on a plane with the food, with their toilets, with their entertainment, with everything. We, uh, they compressed the cabin so that people don't feel asphyxiated once in the heavens. And you have two pilots driving that entire incredible feast of engineering. Computers, electricity, wires, you've got wind, kerosene, you've got engines. Oh God, it's, 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 it's mind-boggling that intellect that Allah has given us, we could fly tons upon thousands of tons in the skies. And we can't use it to reason the Quran. If Allah has given a shaitan only whispers, how can we claim that a shaitan can produce magic? How? It's, it's, it, to me, it's, 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 the intellect of a human is what differentiates a human from an animal. Because Allah wanted to speak to people who understand him. Animals do not understand Allah. Animals act on instinct and instinct only. But sadly, we gave our brains, our intellect a break. We sent them in a long hibernation in some remote cave in our souls. And we're wasting our time listening to time losers. I'm going to put a spell on you. The jinn are going to inhabit you. Oh, there is magic. Your eyes are evil. You're going to hurt my child. How? 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 You see, my dear sisters, and my brothers, when Allah declared that he is the king and the owner of people on earth, and he is the divine that ought to be worshipped based on the freedom. You, he doesn't force you to worship him. He would like you to worship him so that he doesn't punish, his, uh, punish you later on, but you are free. And because Allah teaches us to call upon him with these attributes, it's be that the Lord of the people, the King of the people, the, the, the deity of people, Allah summarizes our interaction, relation, religion with him. He is our Lord, he owns us, and he is the one to be worshipped. That's fine. So when we are on earth and we see other people that do the same thing, they feel Allah and they believe Allah is their Lord, and that he owns them, and then they worship him, and be that they follow the Torah, or the gospel, or they are Hindus, or Buddhists, or they, uh, they worship a cow, or they worship a monkey, or they worship a piece of rock in Mecca. No, we don't worship it, but to the other people is we do. Since we also, when we see somebody prostrating to a cow, we tell him, do not worship the cow. They're gonna say, we don't worship the cow. We worship the spirit that the cow carries. Exactly the same answer as the one we give to somebody when he tells us, you worship al Kaaba, you worship a rock. We say, no, 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 we do not worship a, uh, a rock, we are worshiping what it stands for, Allah. So it's the same answer. And that flexibility between humans hurts a shaitan. Really, it does. And the reason being is this, to every human, Allah has sent a warner. Even if we don't know about that, even if we don't uh, seem to th know who that is, but each and every person, not I mean, not person, nation on earth have received there at one point or the other their warner. Allah states in the Quran, Inna arsalnaka bil haqqi bashiran wa nadiran. We have sent you, Muhammad, of course, talking to Muhammad, to deliver the truth and the good news to people. So Muhammad came with the truth, and that truth, which is the Quran, has good news 
and bad threats uh, to, to the people, to the evildoer. And then Allah says, وَإِمِّنْ أُمَّةٍ And there is not a nation that has not had its warner. Either we know it or we don't know it. And this is in Surah Fatir, Surah 35, Ayah 24. In another ayah, Allah addresses Muhammad. And he says, إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُنْذِرٌ The only thing that you do, ya Muhammad, you are a warner. And to each nation, وَلِكُلِّ قَوْمٍ هَادٍ And to each nation, their own guide. And this, the, their own guide is part of the promise that Allah has made to our father Adam and to, to our mother when he kicked them out from paradise, another paradise as in, in the sky, in the gardens here of training. He gave them, he made them a promise. He tells them, إِهْبِطَا مِنْهَا جَمِيعًا You both descend from the garden of where you are now. I, you now go to the open land. بَعْضُكُمْ لِبَعْضٍ عَدُوٍ All of you, enemies to all of you, meaning humans to the devil, to the shaitan, we are uh, his enemy and he is our enemy. فَإِمَّا يَأْتِيَنَّكُمْ مِنِّي هُدًا but should a guidance from me come to you, please keep this in mind, that Allah sends only guidance to humans. Later on, when we will speak about the angels who came to teach the children of Israel magic, this will become extremely important. That Allah doesn't send angels with magic to teach people to, so that people disbelieve. Allah only sends guidance from Him to us. فَمَنِ اتَّبَعَ هُدَيَ فَلَا يَضِلُّ وَلَا يَشْقَ And whoever follows my guidance, they shall not go astray or be in misery on judgment day. And this is in Surah Taha, Surah 20, and the Ayah 123. So, Allah guides us to call upon Him as our Lord, as our King, as the God that we shall worship. And I'm talking about Surah 114, the last Surah in the Quran. So what are we seeking refuge in the King, in the Lord, in the King, and in the God to be worshipped? Guess what? Well, guess what? And the only one that can take us away and corrupt our belief in the Lord, in the King, and in the God, Lucifer, a shaitan. And that's why Allah states to him, من شر الوسواس الخناس From the evil of the hidden whisperer. A shaitan can only whisper. Anyone who tells you that a shaitan can create magic or, or uh, disease or things like that is a liar. Because the shaitan only whispers in the hearts of people and he does that to both the humans and the jinn. Please go back to Surah 114 and, and read the ayah and, you, and you'll see it, it's there, it's right in front of us. Surah 114 summarizes the human relationship, religion with their creator. Allah is our Lord. He is our owner both in this life and on judgment day. And for that he should be the one to follow and his word should matter to us. And since both the humans and the jinn are a produce of their own thinking, and because each and every one of them is free to decide what they want to decide, a shaitan aims his deceptive techniques to the core of our action, our thought. A shaitan is not interested in, in, in magic. He is not interested in evil eye and he is not interested in envy. He is interested in your mind. He is interested in putting those crooked thoughts in your heart, in your mind of course, so that you generate actions with them and you go do evil. The person who has a phone and he doesn't let his wife look into the phone and it's always on silent and he never... Why are you doing that, mister? What are you hiding? Well, guess what? A shaitan has put in his heart and his mind, your wife is not as sexy as uh, uh, Joanne or as uh, Alice outside. Go on dating websites and meet people. Live a little. 
life is good and Allah is forgiven and the man slowly slowly following the footstep of the shaitan starts behaving in a manner that is not good it all started one day when he trusted the shaitan with one of his thoughts and just like a bait in the ocean it takes one bite for the fish to be picked up by the hook of the sins and this is extremely important when someone to you comes and says oh you know what magic evil eye heard tell him no if shaitan could produce magic he'd be the first one to benefit and take everything with him and even though Allah is clear very clear about these matters of magic evil eye and all those things the truth of the matter is we Muslims do not believe and we don't trust in what Allah truly say in the Quran and why because the Quran isn't the only source of Islam we have all kinds of other corruptive thought, things around the Quran well I'm gonna mention to you a few things why Allah in the Quran establishes there is no magic by now you understand there is no magic I hope you have reached that but if you are still confused doubtful whatever I'm gonna mention and this is now when we're gonna get deep into the world of uh, Musa with the sorcerers and Suleiman this is gonna be a little bit enchanting because I'm gonna take you back in time we're gonna all the way back to the pharaohs of Egypt, the great Egypt. We're even gonna go back to Babylon. It's beautiful. So please tighten your things and if you're tired, I am, you can hear it in my voice. I'm just uh, a little bit sick these days. But the promise is a promise. I gotta record this, so please excuse me for that. Now let's take a journey into the world of magic from different angles. Where Allah establishes that there is no magic, there is no evil eye. And there is no envy and there is no possession of the human by the jinn but he will tell us what magic is and we're going to take now Musa versus the magicians of the Pharaoh to bring the story into kind of like harmony I'm gonna start by saying that uh, you know the story of the mother of Musa who wanted uh, who had to uh, put her child in a small basket and put him in the river and the river took him to Pharaoh so all that part is true and Musa grows in the castle of Pharaoh taking so he had a beautiful uh, youth uh, it's almost like he was born with a golden uh, spoon in his mouth and then Musa grows and you know the story when he ran away from the castle of the Pharaoh because he had punched somebody and out of inadvertence he didn't mean it but uh, the punch killed the Egyptians and then Musa had to run away because the Egyptians were looking for the criminal who did that Musa runs away to another man and he spends there about 10 years and then in those 10 years Musa got married and he got homesick and he wanted back to Egypt he took his wife and whoever was with him and he set off from Mesopotamia somewhere Iraq somewhere the eastern parts and then all the way walking down back to Egypt and on the way in one night it was extremely cold in the desert it was cold in the desert Musa with his uh, uh, family family is his wife Musa didn't have children but he had his wife and maybe a couple of servants and things like that and in that night usually they would set the fire on torches so that they see where they are or they camp and uh, wait in the daytime so that they don't get lost but that night it was impossible for Musa to do anything about it a it was cold B it was extremely windy and it was very very as I said cold he couldn't get the fire going and somewhere he saw somewhere he saw some kind of a light and he goes oh these people are already camping and they have fire so he took his wife and whoever was with him a little bit closer and then the Quran tells us how he went into a discussion with his wife don't go here she said he goes, uh, he goes to her I'm gonna go I, we need some light some fire so that we know what we're doing 
And then she says, don't go. Maybe there are people bad. They're going to hurt you. He goes, no, it's too cold here. And you are cold, my sweetheart. And I'm going to get you some fire because I want my wife to be warm. I don't want you to struggle. She goes, please don't go. He tells her, I'm going to go because we are lost. We need guidance. Please. After intense debates and the Quran has reported all of them, Musa sits on his way in the darkness just with his stuff. And he walks into a bush that had some sort of fire from far. You'll see it's a fire. But when you get close, he ain't no fire. And Musa was surprised. What a trick is that? And as he mesmerized in the light that was surrounding the tree, he heard a voice. He heard a voice. Ya Musa, inni an Allah. I am Allah. Oh, it gives me shivers, this one. I am Allah. Imagine that. You hear a voice in the darkness, in that cold desert. Someone calls upon you with your name. Ya Musa, inni an Allah. I am Allah. Anyhow, the conversation goes, Allah introduces himself and talks a little bit about the judgment today. And Musa there is completely lost. Musa talking to a God. And that is the closest you can get to a God. It was the night Musa had a true conversation. It was not a recording. It was not an amplification. It was Allah wa kallam Allahu Musa takliman. And Allah addressed Musa in true speech. That's it. Our scholars went into details. Was it the voice of Allah? Does Allah have voice? Can Allah have a voice box? And they went, and I don't care about all. All I care about is that the voice that Musa heard represented Allah and he understood that that is Allah speaking. The rest to me is unimportant. All this and then Allah demands to Musa, وَمَا تِلْكَ بِيَمِينِكَ يَا مُوسَى What is it that you hold in your right hand, Musa? Musa had his staff. And it was a long staff. You know, one of those things you hold it and then you grab it, but it's still taller than you. Musa started telling Allah what he does with that staff. He goes, uh, I shake the trees, wait for the leaves to fall so that my animals can eat from that. And I, and I walk with it and I defend myself with it and I do a lot of other things with it. So Allah tells him, yeah, Musa, throw it on the ground. And Musa, without hesitating, throws it. And as he threw it, guess what? It turned into a snake in a big, gigantic, scary anaconda-like snake, big one. When Musa saw it, he got extremely afraid. He was scared to death. He turned away and he ran away and he didn't turn around him to see if the, uh, the, another uh, fish, if the snake was following him or not. When Musa ran away, Allah called him, Ya Musa, come back here. My messengers do not get scared from that. And then when Musa come back and snake as big as it is, I wanted to imagine that in the dark of the night, Allah orders Musa to take the, 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 the stuff back. We will return it as it once was, i.e. a piece of wood. And that night, the world of Musa and humanity after him got shaken to the core. That night Musa saw how a piece of stuff can turn into a real animal and how a real animal a snake with blood and skin and everything, a slither and everything can go back to being one stone cold piece of wood. That was the training of Musa. Later on, we will see why Allah decided to speak to Musa. He could have just revealed to him like he did with all other messengers and prophets. But why did he speak to Musa? What it is that Musa needed that Allah had given to him through speech? After all, Musa was sent to a man who claimed to be a god. That is not the first time, and that is not the last time. 
But we will see later on, inshallah, as to why Musa was spoken to. Musa goes to the Fir'aun. Fir'aun receives Musa. Allah had given a guarantee to Musa that nobody could harm him. And that gave the confidence to Musa to go to Egypt. Reason being, Allah is protecting him. He told him, I am with you. I can see, I can hear. Go to Fir'aun. So that's why when Musa presented himself to Fir'aun, Fir'aun, the God, the one who wanted to kill Musa, couldn't do anything about it. Musa gets a sixth place in the court of the Pharaoh. He wanted to speak to the Pharaoh. He's got a message after all. He is almost the adopted child of Pharaoh. The wife of Pharaoh was excited to see Musa. Pharaoh, not so much. So Musa gets to the Pharaoh and tells him, I am an envoy of Allah and he sent me for you to set the children of Israel free to leave to the promised land, Pharaoh was not ready to do such a thing. And that moment there, and he did not believe that Musa could be a sent person by God, since Pharaoh is the God, and claiming that another God sent somebody to the Pharaoh is challenging his authority. So, to prove his case, Musa showed the hand to Pharaoh, and I will speak more on details, in detail, excuse me, <clears throat> uh, in details about the hand, but what matters to us today is the staff of Musa. Musa throws the staff on the floor. Pharaoh sees the animal, but Pharaoh is not that much scared because he's used to the tricks and elusive action of the magicians. So when he saw that, he realized that Musa was just trying to tempt him and deceive him by the looks of things. But Pharaoh could see that what Musa had presented was not a trick of a magician. It was a real snake. Upon that, the Pharaoh and his people told Musa, مهما تأتنا به من آية لتسحرنا بها فما نحن لك بمؤمنين No matter what great sign you may bring to bewitch and sorcerer us with we will never believe in you So Pharaoh has laid it down in front of Musa and everybody else we consider you to be a magician and because of that and anything else, we will never believe in you no matter what show you put for us. In one of the ayahs, when the argument got intense between the Musa and the Fir'aun, Fir'aun told Musa, okay, I challenge you because you're a magician, we have magicians. We can challenge you, ya Musa. And just pick up a time and a date and a place for that matter and we will be there. Musa looked around and he said, okay, I will meet you on day so and so. It was a celebration day. It was a bank holiday, as you would say here in England. You don't work. National day. And Musa made a special request. Since Musa is going to be challenged by other magicians, he demanded that the challenge takes place right in the middle of the day, in the midst of the day, when the sky is at zenith, i.e. there is no way to deceive people. If Musa had left it to the magicians, they would do it at the time of Maghrib, or sunset, or at night. But Musa wanted it right in the middle of the day, so that people see who is the true magician and who is not. Musa didn't want to prove to Pharaoh that he, he was magic, even though, with the way we look at it, it was pure magic. Turning a staff into a snake, and then a snake back to a staff. If that is not magic, what is? But we know it's not magic. Because that is a power that Allah gave to Musa with that stuff. So, Pharaoh sends in Egypt to every uh, sorcerer that is there. At first, they were interested in normal sorcerers, magicians. 
And then, after a conversation and discussion with the Pharaoh, they saw that Musa had some pretty strong, convincing acts of magic. And if we want any success against him, then we need the best of the best. So, Pharaoh sent around in the entire Egypt Peninsula. And it was not just Egypt as we know it today. It was extended all the way to southern parts of Turkey, including the Holy Land and part of uh, Jordan and Lebanon. And it went all the way to Mesopotamia, that is where uh, Iraq today, southern parts of Iraq. It was a big empire that the Pharaoh had ruled. So the magicians, the expert ones, come and Pharaoh welcomes them into his castle and nearby. A strange conversation took place between the magicians and the Pharaoh. Allah recounted that uh, exchange between them two. وَجَاءَ السَّحَرَةُ فِرْعَوْنَ And the magicians came to the Pharaoh, they arrived. قَالُوا And they said, إِنَّ لَنَا لَأَجْرًا إِن كُنَّ نَحْنُ الْغَالِبِينَ Will there be any reward for us? Should we be the winners? The Pharaoh jumped up on the opportunity because now he's going to give them more incentives to want to win. He said, Yes, قال نعم. وإنكم لمن المقربين. Not only will you have recompense and payments and things. No, 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 no. He said, Yes, and you shall indeed be of those who will be brought close to me. I.e. in status, they're going to be close to Pharaoh. Perhaps he's going to make them ministers or something. But that was the promise. The one thing that we should really start paying attention to and Pharaoh should have as well. What did the magicians ask? Will there be a reward for us? Now, does it make sense to you that a magician who can create something extremely incredible, impossible even, but cannot create his own reward, he has to get it from somewhere else? That tells you that this magician is not for real, no matter what his skills are. It's just a sleight of hand. But Pharaoh did not pick on that, and it's going to cost him a lot later on. So, the day of the challenge came. Musa goes there, and the magicians go there. The, the, the palladium, or the place uh, where Pharaoh sits, the platform, and all the throne, and the gold, and everything is there. On the other hand, and thousands of people came to watch what the magicians will do. They get there. The magicians, having had an exchange with Musa before, so they are already aware of him, but they don't know the capabilities of the staff of Musa. All they did was, they just heard somebody say that when Musa throws the stuff, it turns into a snake, and they went, <laughs> what a kind of thing, anyone can do that, it's, it's, it's just simple magical trick, we're capable of it. Had they checked with Musa, had they asked Musa to show them his trick before, they would never ever have walked and challenged Musa because they know the craft and they know what Musa has is by no mean of chance any magic. It was the truth. So they get to Musa and in front of everybody, now they have the guarantee of Pharaoh is going to pay them. Not only that, he's going to establish them near his status, meaning they will have dinners with him and things like that. When they got to the field and Musa is facing the magicians and uh, imagine the tension there, the sun is there, people nicely dressed and uh, the, uh, the Pharaoh is sitting there, the magicians, they have their stuff with them. Musa is just standing with them, just holding a stick in his hand. That's all he's got, right? So the magicians come to Musa and they ask him, Yeah, Musa, do you want to go first? Uh, you throw your stuff and you show what you got? or what you got it, and we will throw after you and we show what we got and people will decide which one is better. Or uh, we go, decide, you go or we go, to us is no big deal. 
and that was a vote of confidence from them either way you go if uh, Musa you shall lose and acting with the name of the Pharaoh of the Pharaoh it means Musa no matter where you go the Pharaoh wins all right he said Alqum. no 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 he goes you throw whatever you got what did the magicians do? They went and put one of the most magnificent uh, displays out there of magicry, of magic. And then when they cast their ropes and sticks and everything they had, saharu a'yun nas meaning they fooled the eyesight of people. They bewitched the eyes of people, i.e. they fooled the people with their trick. And then was tarhabuhum, and they did things to terrorize people, so that the feeling of people goes in harmony with what the magicians had produced. In other words, what they did is simple, really simple. When you look at it, they created an environment which can scare people, and then they threw the rocks and everything onto the people was wow everything played in the favor of the magicians even Musa got scared from that and then Allah gives them the most beautiful and the true uh, review of their act and Allah says and they came up with a great sorcery and witchcraft but of course it's not a real one it's a sleight of hand but that's what Allah said it's a great trick of magic as you can see Allah is describing to us what happened between the magicians the Pharaoh Musa and everything and the truth of the matter is this no matter how big a magician can get or is or was he'll always remain somebody who does his tricks based on how much he can deceive the audience and pull the rug right under their own feet and they don't fall for that don't believe me go on youtube and search uh, david blaine pen and teller p e w n and teller t e w l e r they have some beautiful uh, shows seek david copperfield or harry houdini or any other magicians and watch them put some of the most fantastic shows on earth i saw a man who presented to us a box like a coffin and then he goes into it he lies down and he's the magician so he's doing the the trick and the, and there comes his head you could see his head and underneath there you saw his legs so so far so good you would think that somebody's going to get a saw and cut the box into two and then we see nothing and the guy will move his head and his toes and then they will put him back again and that's that right but that didn't take place something else took place and that's something there blew my mind all the while knowing it's a trick the box in which he was lying down started being pushed from both ends and as the feet were getting to the head and there was emptiness and they go how is that possible how is that possible that he can pull such a trick right in front of my eyes i see him and i'm doing every bit of my imagination not to get fooled but he is doing every bit at fooling me this show was put in front of two of the great magicians in the business of course of magic since magic doesn't exist but in the entertainment business his, their names are pen p e double n and teller go on youtube and watch their shows they have some beautiful shows and then the guy finishes his thing the head got close to the feet and and everybody's mes mes mesmerizing go, wow what how, how, how do you do that and then Penn and Teller starts telling him how he pulled the trick. And when they, of course, they talk a riddle so that we don't discover what they are on about. And guess what? And the magician yield. Penn and Teller had busted his move and he didn't fool them because this show is based on fool me, fool two of the great entertainment magician ever. 
So, Musa is there with this one. When they threw their rocks and everything, Musa at first, as, uh, as they were throwing, you know, they don't all throw at the same time. They started throwing. As they were throwing their ropes and things like that, Musa was busy talking to them. He tells them, what you came up with is magic. Uh, it's just a sleight of hand. It's something, uh, when you do it, people don't understand much, but that's what it is. In Allah indeed Allah will nullify it. And even with that statement, Allah says that the magicians had poured a great deal of an act of sorcery. So Musa is talking in general. And then Musa carries on saying, of course, Allah, Inna Allah la yuslihu amal al mufsidin Certainly, surely, and indeed, Allah does not set a right, i.e. make correct, the work of the evildoers or corruptors. Please check Surah number 10, Yunus, Ayah 81, and you, and you work with there. In another Surah, in Surah Taha, Allah gives a little bit in details of what took at, uh, at that very particular moment. The magician standing, Musa standing, and the challenge is starting. Why am I bringing this? Why do I really, uh, how do I say, how am I fixing my attention on this point? Simple. Because this is when and where the deception of the magicians took place in that split divergent, they call it, or divergent, depending on what you talk to. The di when they divert the attention of the watcher to create their magic. And it is here in their exchange with Musa that they were preparing for their trick. And that's why they kept asking, you throw, we throw, Musa throws a little bit, they throw a little bit. And as they are pulling their trick, they are diverting people into believing that we are still busy pulling our act of magic towards him. I'll stop here and carry on in part number four. Salam.